Salaha Khan. I'm currently a first year public policy student, and I'm so happy to see so many familiar and new faces here in the room. Just to give you a quick backstory, a group of us were taking Professor Ralph Bing's Race in America class, which you should totally take. Wonderful. And he assigned us a book. So you want to talk about race, which you should buy online. It's wonderful. And we fell in love with it. And we were like, oh my god, this is so amazing. And it turns out I have a personal connection with her. So we reached out to her. She graciously accepted the invite. And thankfully, we kind of were able to make it happen thanks to our generous co-sponsors. And here we are today. So excited to hear from her and also get your questions answered. Just to share a little bit more about her. She, Ijuma Lua, is a Seattle-based writer, speaker, and internet yeller. Her work on social issues such as race and gender, privilege and power have been published in The Guardian, uh, Washington Post, and DC News, and so on and so forth. She's been an editor at large at the establishment since 2015. Her New York Times best-selling book, So You Want to Talk About Race, which, like I said, if you haven't already, get it. It's amazing. It was released just earlier this year, in January 2018. She's been named one of the most influential people in Seattle by Seattle Magazine and one of the Roots 100 Most Influential Americans in 2017. She's the recipient of the Feminist Humanist Award 2017 by the American Humanist Association. And we're so privileged and blessed to have her with us here today. Please put your hands together and join me in welcoming <laughs> Yeah, let me move this then. Look, it's got pockets. Wouldn't it be hilarious if this dress didn't have pockets? <laughs> uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I, um, it was funny because so, so I was t talking about how she reached out to me. Um, she's married to a cousin of mine. And it was funny because I had, this is, I don't even know. I don't know. What am I doing? I can't. There's nothing here to <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm just going to have to try to project, which I don't usually do. Um, so she reached out to me to ask if I would speak. And was like, oh, I'm married to your cousin Omar. Um, but it was funny because I had just told my intern that I wasn't accepting any more speaking engagements because I just signed my book. And so um, I said, no more for the rest of the year. And so sends this lovely email. It's like, it's so nice to talk to you. <laughs> and then my intern just goes, no. <laughs> and I, like, I was like immediately, like, no, 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 wait, can you please read the, like, we don't, like, it's family. <laughs> she's been on our grand page, like, ever since I told her to no, she's been saying no to everyone, charities, schools, like, it doesn't, she's like, no. <laughs> Let's, let's pause. I, well, I didn't mean like absolutely none, but uh, <laughs> I'm glad that I saw the message and um, got to come here. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I love visiting schools. Um, and I mean, I don't love talking about race. I don't know many people do. I, I know my book says, so you want to talk about race, but I'm being generous. <laughs> I, I know very few, at least people of color, who are like, yay! <laughs> race. We're going to talk about race today. Um, it, you know, I wrote the book because it, it's a very fraught subject. And I wrote it because I was discovering that people were kind of tripping over the same things over and over and over. And I write about this day in and day out. And I have, surprise, been black my whole life. So I've lived <laughs> in day in and day out. And a lot of these things for me as a, as a systems thinker and as someone who was spent a lot of time immersed in this subject matter and looking at it, a lot of these things are second nature to me to discuss. And I found that often people would reach out to me or I'd see arguments online or I'd see events happening. And it was always kind of the same terms that people were getting stuck on over and over and over, or the same kind of pitfalls that would catch people up time and time again. And let me tell you, as someone who gets asked to write the same essay every time this happens, it can get really frustrating. It's very like, you know, Starbucks did a thing. Do you want to write about it? Oh, well, no, this place did a thing. Do you want to write about it? I'm like, why don't you just copy and paste? Because it's, it's all the same conversation. But I found that often, 
interpersonally, when we're trying to make headway, we come across the same issues as well. And there are just a lot of fundamentals that are really important to understanding not only race theory, but how race functions in our day-to-day -day life that we have to know. And it's not so you can win your Facebook argument. It's so that you can actually address these issues as they happen in our lives. So part of why I wrote the book was honestly because I didn't want to write the same essay 10 times. And I do think there's something different about holding a book that you can go back to time and time again and reference. And I recognize this too because the internet is filled with information. It's very easy to forget when things come by. The amount of people who tweet at me and go, didn't you write an article about this thing? Could you remind me where it is? Can you look it up for me and send me the link again because I want to read it again? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and having something that you can really go after, and it's been interesting watching people highlight sections and reread sections and maybe having a difficult conversation and knowing I have to go back and refresh. Uh, I wrote my book kind of as an introduction to taking things out of race theory, out of this kind of abstract space and pulling it into your day-to-day -day lives. And I wrote it because I couldn't find a book like it. And I searched high and low for a book that really talked about how to take these, these kind of complicated issues into where they're hitting you, in your home, in your office, with your family, with your friends. How to get people past the discussion and to action. And I wasn't expecting to write an end all and be all. It's a relatively short book. It turns out actually short books are in style right now. <laughs> it's weird. I mean, this is what the internet has done. You can't really read long books. And so, I mean, it's, and it works well for me because I can't write long books. <laughs> <laughs> it's a win win. Um, instead of seeming lazy, I just seem like I'm with the time. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to think that for such a deep topic would be accessible. You could pick up, breathe, read a chapter, pause for a minute, put it down. I wanted a book where you could use chapters that work for you, maybe skip ones that didn't, and no matter where you landed in the book, you could, you could find something to do. Um, each chapter of the book copy covers either a question. I have been asked many, 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 many times, and I think many people of color will recognize the chapter names. Why can't I touch your hair? Why can't I say the N-word? Is it really about race? And then questions I wish people would ask more. Like, what, you know, what is, you know, um, intersectionality? Why do I need it, right? Uh, a lot of things that people dismiss without actually asking the questions as to why we have these terms, why these things are coming up. And each chapter kind of starts with personal anecdote where these things have come up in my life and to kind of get people to see that these are real things, these aren't just theories, these are things that impact people. And I figure I have a life and I can use that, I can use stories in that. And it's also an emotional hook, I think, for people who may not see why this matters. I think for many people of color, many people of color reach out to me and it's the first half of the chapter that always get to them because something similar has happened to them. You know, they've been stopped by cops and sat there wondering, why did I get stopped? You know, they've had people walk up and touch their hair without permission. They've had people make them feel other or less than and, and weren't sure how to address it or were you know, kind of dismissed when they tried to. And they see themselves in that and know that this is coming from experience, not just a theory in a book. And then for many people who haven't experienced it, you have at least experienced those emotions. You have felt other, you have felt left out, you have felt insulted, you have felt unsafe. And recognizing how that plays out. So that's the, that first half. For me, in a way, it's almost kind of bittersweet to always have to include these things. People of color oftentimes have to when we talk about race. We, if people want to see the blood and the sweat and the pain and the tears before they take it seriously, but the truth is, is that 400 years into this brutal system, we actually shouldn't have to be offering up examples of what this looks like. There, the proof is in the pudding. It's in the stats for how people of color fare in this country. It's in everything we've been saying for over 400 years. We shouldn't have to still be offering up our pain as an example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there were definite times in the book where it, it was very burdensome to do so, where having to dive into things that were very personal and painful to me took quite a toll. But I also knew that this chapter wouldn't be as impactful for certain people who wouldn't just look at the statistics Look at what we, 
we honestly, you know, you can't deny this fact in this day and age and decide they needed to act. And I think that's one of the unfortunate realities of talking about race is that 400 years into this system, we still have to keep proving that it matters. We still have to keep showing scars and blood and pain in order to get people to ally with us and to look at the role that they're playing in this issue. The second half of each chapter really dives into not only the numbers and the stats you need to know, but practical steps to working with this knowledge. It's not just enough to know that there's a problem. You have to then know what that means to your life and some ideas of how you could have discussions about this with other people with the aim of identifying action. And I think it's really important that people understand that I want us talking about race not because I think we should all be in some weird group therapy together, but because that's how we can identify where we have opportunity for change, right? And the, the way that privilege works is you can't see it. And you're not supposed to see it. You're not supposed to see where you are privileged. You're not supposed to see where your life is different from the lives of other people because that's how you play along. I do fundamentally believe that most people are at least as good as we can define goodness. It's such a weird term to be a good person. But I do fundamentally believe that most people do not walk through their day wanting to harm other people. And the way in which that we conform to these systems of power and uphold these systems of power, a lot of it requires us to be ignorant of the role we play. And it is only really through this conversation that we can find where we've been playing these roles. It's from hearing from someone that maybe this thing you, you said in the classroom was harmful. Or hearing from someone that maybe this curriculum isn't suiting everyone, isn't representing everyone. Or hearing that maybe you know the way that this office is set up isn't welcoming for every employee. It's hearing these things, recognizing there's a reality outside of your own, with a goal of, ma of making change that you can really do. But if you don't have that conversation, if you think you can just find it in a book, you're not going to get anywhere. And I do run into a lot of people who think they can read enough books to never actually have to talk to a real person of color about race, <laughs> right? I, I literally, I have white people who walk up to me all the time and recommend books to me <laughs> about race. Like, oh, well, if you want to understand this better, you should have like, whoa, <laughs> 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 <Did> you? <laughs> um, but they really do feel like, you know, and people tell me, people will, when confronted, start listing the books they've read. Now, I am pro-book. <laughs> Just so you all know. <laughs> I'm not anti-book, please. Buy books. Buy my book. Um, <laughs> but we write these books based on lived experiences, and they are all limited in scope. They are all us trying to do our part, do our piece. But every person out there is an expert. Every person of color is an expert on these issues. They are living these issues day in and day out. And they are adding things that I learn from every day. And you need to hear, because what you need to hear is not only the theory, but you need to hear about how you are interacting with it. You need to hear what you could be doing better, what you haven't been doing right. And I think that that's what we try to do here. And that's what I hope people get out of my book. I don't want people reading the book feeling uncomfortable and then feeling like the fact that they felt uncomfortable for a couple hours is their anti-racist work for the day. And people love to do that. It's really interesting, I find that people will walk to come hear me speak because I'm not known as being nice, right? And they want to come, they want me to make them feel bad. <laughs> because then they get to go online and say, well, I listened to a drama and I felt awful. John. <laughs> and, I mean, you know, that's a fun time for everyone. But <laughs> it's, it's very, a very little use to and I think that we need to always be looking at action, right? And if you come to these things, if you're reading this work, if you're, if you, you know, a lot of people will go through and they'll read like, you know, like they'll read like Between the World and Me, just feel gutted. And they'll be like, they'll list that as their accomplishment for the year, right? That was their anti-racism action. Is they felt bad about Tanahasi Coates' chapbook. He doesn't care. He doesn't want you to feel bad. 
He wants you to recognize something so that you can know there's an issue. So you can look at things. He wants to be heard. And he wants you then to start looking at the world and the system around you. He doesn't necessarily, your tears are not in a machine. But people love to do that. And all you're doing, if you, if you, if you aren't looking at these things for action, if you aren't looking at these things with an end goal in mind of helping deconstruct these systems, all you're really doing is exploiting the pain and trauma. And so you always have to be aware of that. That you are then just a consumer. You're a consumer of black pain and trauma. And that's not okay, right? Don't go, you know, we've all, you know, go see 12 Years a Slave and you're like, oh, it's, slavery was awful. I cried. <laughs> see how good I am? No, it's not how that works. So I'm, you know, I'm passionate about this. I'm passionate about this because I've spent the last year traveling talking about my book. And I can often tell the difference between when I am asked to, I mean, everyone, can, you, can you all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. All right, because then I don't have to. You, yeah. you want me to hold the mic? Yes. yes. All right. Can I this off? I don't want to like bump them into each other. <laughs> All right, better? Yes. All right, now I can go back to being to my regular voice. Um, what was I saying? I was probably yelling about something. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, oh yeah, okay, so you guys got the point, I think. <laughs> I think we can, we can move on. Uh, oh yeah, so I've been traveling the last year, and I've definitely noticed the difference of when I go to a place because people just want to hear someone talk, or they're like, they follow me online, and they want to like know, you know, do I really put as much time into my makeup for appearances as I do for Instagram, you know? <laughs> or if they have a specific problem they are looking to solve and they want me to come and, and speak and help facilitate conversation on it. And there's a definite difference in the room. And I would definitely say that right now looking at this room, we have a fairly diverse room, right? And especially, honestly, I hate to say this, but for traditionally white college campuses, um, this is a fairly diverse room. Even when I'm coming, a black woman coming, oftentimes I end up in universities where a lot of people of color don't feel safe, aren't welcomed, or there are many other reasons why there's not a lot of students of color even fewer faculty of color, and I'm speaking to a room of people who just want to say they came. But I would say that right now you have a great opportunity being in this room to start looking at the environment that you're building on campus. I love universities, I love high schools, I love coming to schools because I feel like these are smaller, more contained areas to start practicing community building. And it matters, right? Of course, edu higher education matters, what you learn matters but also how you engage with your environment and your expectations of socio-political realms matters. And right now you have more power on your campus than you have in just about any other space outside of like when you become a mom like I do and you get to make all the rules. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's really important to take that seriously and start looking at your environment like it matters. I think that a lot of times people in collegiate environments are discounted, right? You're there to study, but you're still a kid. You're still in this kind of fake world that's not real. But the truth is, is that you don't leave college and suddenly know how to take ownership of the greater world. You don't just wake up and then suddenly you're like, I am a full adult, <laughs> this is mine. Right now, while you have more say, while you have more power than you think you do, you need to start learning how to leverage it. And this means that you first need to start looking at the system you're in and start really deconstructing the collegiate system. You need to start looking at how universities are set up, how your college is set up. You need to start looking at some of the biases that may well have been built into the very beginnings and honestly, every traditionally white institution has them and find out where that still exists today, where it informs what you do today. So, Start looking at the system you're in, right? Look at the matriculation rate for students of color. Look at the enrollment rate for students of color. Look at the disciplinary information. And a lot of schools try to hide that information as well as to how many students of color are disciplined, are you know, detained by campus police, 
How many aren't spelled? Start asking about those numbers. Start asking about matriculation. Start asking about tenure for professors of color. Find out where you're at. Find that starting point. Then start looking at your textbooks. Right? Look at what you're reading and why. Start looking for what, what is an option for your education that isn't being offered to you. Start looking at who has impact into what you're learning. Who, whose voice is welcomed when it comes to deciding what classes are necessary, what majors are offered. Know where you're at. And then start looking at where you interact with that system. So look at where you have impact, where you have say, whether it's student housing, whether it's meetings that you get to be involved in, whether it's just raising your hand in your class and asking questions. You have plenty of ways, and your parents also have plenty of ways in which they have influence over how the system runs. Start identifying staff that are also open to hearing these issues. And start leveraging that as well. Start calling teachers who say all of the right things to act. And it's scary. I'm not trying to, I know, I know teachers in here, some of y'all are like, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> Stop doing that. <laughs> But I'm doing this for your benefit too, right? Because there are a lot of things I know that staff thinks about all the time that they would love to be able to do and they can't because they don't feel they have the support. So I'm activating a student base that you can also rely upon to back up what you're saying as well. You know there's a problem and you know how it works in the system. And now you need students to also be empowered to speak out about this as well so you can come together and start looking at these issues. And if you don't think there's a problem, then chances are, if you're walking through your day thinking that there's no issue of race on your campus, there's no issue of race in your curriculum, if you're not hearing from any of the people of color in your life about these issues, I need you to pause for a second. Because what that means is that you have been identified as unsafe. And I know that that's hard to hear because you can think that you're very, very close to people, but you have sent a signal in some way that you are not someone who can be talked to about this and start looking, about, looking at why these conversations aren't ha happening around you. What you may be putting out there that is making people feel unsafe. And it may not even be that you're putting something out there to make people feel unsafe, but you haven't put anything out there to make people feel safe. Trust has to be earned, especially when people of color have been let down and betrayed so often. You don't get to just show up and then have people be like, you're my new friend, I'm gonna tell you about all the racism here. Because this conversation ends poorly for us 90% of the time. So start looking at that. If you're not seeing an issue, if you're not seeing it in your classes, if you're not seeing it with your friends, if you're not seeing it in your environment, start wondering why you're not seeing it and start investigating it. And then start looking at where you have power. And right now, like I said, you have a voice that is heard more than it probably ever will be in your life. And it may not seem like it, but this is one of the few places where you, know, you are actually paying for this system to run, right? <laughs> you are, and you can be that annoying student, because I know it's always annoying your student to be like, I pay your salary. You know what, though? <laughs> you do. <laughs> Start leveraging that, right? And keep it up, once you're out of here, keep leveraging it through the alumni system. Utilize that power, get used to it, because then when you get into an office, or when you, you know, get into any other air system in the broader world, you're gonna be more used to looking for things. Set norms, not only for yourself, but for your peers. What you're saying right now is, what is and is not acceptable in the adult world. And what is and is not accepted in the adult world. You're setting the expectation now. And yes, I still think you need time to go party and be kids and make horrible, horrible, horrible mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> but also know that you are setting expectations for not only yourself, but for all of those who are in your life. And start looking at what you want to be the norm and what you want to be unacceptable. And especially start looking at that from an anti-racist perspective. And if you do that, if you keep that fire right now, there's a lot of pressure 
on college students to get ready to leave this behind, right? College is the time to be outraged, right? It's your time to start yelling about things and to experiment. And I run into, you know, I am, I have, I have a son I'm sending off to college next year, hopefully, that's a long discussion. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> and I run into other parents whose kids have graduated the year before and the year before, and they'll be like, oh God, you know, my kid came home and now she's anti-capitalist, you know? And <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was hanging out with my brother, and we ran into a mom who was complaining about this and how her son had come home for the holidays and was, you know, challenging everything in the house. And my brother looked at her and he's like, there's worse things than the kid that challenges our powers, power structures. And the truth is, is we should actually be encouraging that. We sh it shouldn't just be a time to experiment with caring about right and wrong. Okay? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent, even though this often bites me in the ass as a parent, of kids throwing more fits, right? We, our kids throw fits, we threw fits as kids because things weren't fair, right? Or because we were tired. <laughs> but, you know, someone cut in line, someone got a bigger piece of something, someone got a purple one and you wanted a purple one, you threw a fit because it wasn't fair, it wasn't right. What's the first thing your parents tell you when, you when you throw a fit and you're saying it's not fair? <laughs> right? <laughs> Life's not fair. Now, when we think about it, what we're telling our kids is, is to expect life to not be fair <coughs> and to be okay with it. But is that really what we want to be? When we look at the vast inequality in this world, in this country, do we really want to walk around going, yeah, life's not fair, meh. I mean, I would say that's why we're in the problem we're in right now. We live in a country right now where the average black household has one thirteenth the net worth of the average white household. That's an unfairness that kills. And we look at it and we shrug and go, eh, life's not fair. Throw more fits. Throw them in your classrooms. Throw them when you go home. Right? Be the kids that, whose parents I run into at the grocery store but keep being that person. And, it, and know that it matters. And know that you deserve to be heard. Know that you are talking about something valid and the way that you're seeing the world is real. And that you are just as capable of interpreting what's happening as the next person is. And you have every right to be heard for it. And every right to be outraged at things that are outrageous. Then there are a lot of outrageous things happening in this country right now and in our communities right now. 